Attention, please. Eastern Airlines Flight 19, now ready for departure. Welcome aboard the Walt Disney World Express Monorail. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're entering the vacation kingdom of the world. There's enough land here to hold all of the ideas and plans we could possibly imagine. We call it Epcot. Will be our experimental prototype city of tomorrow. Welcome to another episode of the Retro Disney World Podcast. Taking you back to the vacation kingdom of the world. The way it was and the way it is in your memories. The Disney Sunday movie will not be seen tonight, but we'll return next week with Ask Max. Now stay tuned for the following special presentation. All right, welcome to another episode of the Retro Disney World Podcast, the official podcast of the Lake Buena Vista Historical Society. I'm your host, Todd McCartney, and tonight we'll be taking you back here on episode 88 to Back to the Future. See what we did there? Yeah, we've been waiting a long time for this, but uh, where this is kind of uh, what we would call our friendly neighbor policy, where we're going to be talking about some retro uh, attractions and neighborly uh, to, to Walt Disney World. But before we get into that, as always, coming from Ohio, Mr. J.T. Couser, how are you doing tonight, J.T.? Before you step on an airplane and fly, I believe. Yeah, tomorrow night, tomorrow. Um, be heading to the Sunshine State, Very and nice. uh, I'm excited though. This was a uh, attraction I rode, I visited in the mm-hmm. early years. So I, I'm I'm all about this. I am about it too, because Back to the Future has been a staple in our house, and uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. But uh, coming in from the Saint Petersburg area. Um, and maybe how Bowers can inform us who St. Petersburg is, or is it St. Peter's and that's his burg? I don't know which way it is, but <laughs> how are you doing tonight, Al? Aloha. Uh, I am doing fine. Uh, I'm trying to remember. I, I think the deal was uh, someone who was one of the early founders was had family that was some, from St. Petersburg, and there was like a coin toss between the two guys that were kind of starting up this area of of who was going to get the naming rights. Oh, and the St. Petersburg person won. And I think the other one ended up being Dunedin or something, which was a Irish name. Hmm. So, or Scottish, Scottish name. So, so we ended up with St. Petersburg here or was it? No, sorry. It wasn't St. Peter. It wasn't Dunedin. It was, uh, Really How we'll be back next here. month with the actual yeah, answer. Yeah, I'll figure out the answer. I, <laughs> okay. It was in Gulf Porter. It's not uh, somewhere. somewhere. Anyways, that's how Welcome. we got. That's how we got St. Petersburg. There we go. And coming in from the city of brotherly love, Mr. Brian P. Miles. How you doing tonight, Brian? I'm fantastic. Here in Bluebell, Pennsylvania, which was yes. originally Pigeon Town, Pennsylvania, in the oh. pre-colonial times. I guess in the 1700s, before George Washington made it through. But we've been Bluebell for the last, that's one of the villages in town, and that's our post office, named after the bar, after the tavern, the Bluebell the Blue Bell Inn. Uh, so uh, I might Man, be the I, only one that lives in a town yeah. named after the bar. You know? I can't believe they gave up Pigeon Town. Well, I mean, Bert and Ernie, would, Bert would have loved it. He would have there loved is, it Sesame there, Street. There is a sign <laughs> that used to get stolen quite frequently. Pennsylvania's got these historical markers all over the state, and there is one that is, you know, Welcome to Bluebell, formerly Pigeon Town, and it would have Pigeon the, Town. you know, that it was named that because there at one time was a, a you know, a, we were proliferate in the amount of pigeons that were here. I have not seen a pigeon in Bluebell in all my years living here, uh, but but that is the case. Well, gentlemen, it's great to see everybody again. We got over the, we got through the holidays and got over those. And Brian, I, you and I spent a little time together. You came up to the gray New England, where I think we saw every sign in a forty mile radius and tried all sorts of foods and uh, enjoyed the hot tub. And it was it was a nice visit. Well, I got to see Boston from about two hundred feet up. That's when the cloud cover ended. <laughs> uh, when I came into land and I saw New Hampshire until I was about 100 feet in the air when I took off from Manchester because it was just, you know, not the not the best weather wise those few days after Christmas. But, yeah, we had a, we had a, we had a, we had a ball and we got yeah. to see our friend Gary. Uh, yeah. Who runs on and off the stage there at Retro Magic, setting things up for us. 
He came down and had lunch with us at the Mai Kai and uh, Todd Kowloon. took me. Kowloon. At Kowloon, I'm sorry. Right. Kowloon, okay. the, the Massachusetts Mai Kai. There you go. There and, you go. Uh, and you know, we I got a nick, the nickel tour of uh, everything you wanted to see alongside the roadway. He knows exactly what I liked. <laughs> he said, here's a great place for donuts. We ended up at a British uh, food store, and I bought the world's largest assortment of British chocolates to send to JT's daughter, who's yeah. uh, going through uh, a, a candy ranking test. Uh, maybe people from around, around the, the world can start sending her stuff, JT, if you're running out of stuff. <laughs> yeah, a, a little, uh, what's the word, a little... Uh, context here is we were in the store one day and she goes dad what's a candy bar and not that there were like <laughs> vegan anti-sugar people or something like we just i mean she's had candy bars she just didn't know what the concept of it was so we went through and we've been just getting candy and she rates it and i have a whole list going and so this we try fantastic. various candies and brian and todd they get they sent a big box it's, yeah. it's funny you know you like you can tell your kids spoiled like uh, she's looked at it and she goes she was very excited, but she also was like, oh, cool, okay, and on to the next thing. It wasn't like a shock because you've done it before. So so she's not going to do like a YouTube channel where she tries candy bars anytime soon. No, because we're also running out, and it's yeah. half the time she's like, yeah, I give that a nine. I go, you gave the last one a nine. She goes, well, it's still good. It's just, like, they're all good. <laughs> the ratings are not exactly a little subjective. No, so I have, to, I have to go back oh. and be like, yeah, you gave Mr. Goodbar a nine. Was it as good right. as Mr. Goodbar or, you know, that type yeah. of way? She's, well, I think... Uh, She's the Dave Portnoy of uh, of chocolate of candy that's bars. It. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yep. And Brian, you and I, I think we ate every three hours, and we lit a cake on fire with rum. We did all sorts we, of stuff. We so. did buy a Christmas pudding and light it on fire, and it was uh, it was a very very nice spray. That week's always uh, a little. I, I get stir crazy because we're we're uh, you know there's not a lot of work to do at the office and. You know, I'm just kind of hanging out here, so that was a nice, it was a nice time up there. And good, I'm glad you, you enjoyed know, it. So we I've now it been to everybody's house, but JT, so uh, expect me, you know, any day now. <laughs> <laughs> he might just show up, so be ready. Right be while ready. you're gone tomorrow, he's yeah. just going to break in. <laughs> well, the funny thing is, about a month ago, maybe on my Instagram feed, some pizza place in Akron popped up, and I'm like, man, this looks awesome. And I sent it to JT and. I'm like, this place looks great. And he's like, that's actually like the only place I would take you if you came to Akron. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a well-known Akron uh, tradition, Luigi's. It's, it's that. big time. It's uh, cash only, and uh, the line's usually out the door because there's no seats, and they've got a vintage uh, you know, animatronic bandstand in there and all oh, that wow. stuff. So. But it they look, like, look like a great red gravy joint. So. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, JT, we will pass it over to you. Uh, now we're done with our general banter and introductions, as always. Uh, JT, you go out and fetch the mailbag, and uh, pretty full this uh, this month, and I think you've got some interesting things to talk about, too. Yes, uh, lots of stuff related to our last episode, which I thought was uh, good. First one was from Jason Burley. Uh, we're getting right into it here. Jason said, hey, guys, really enjoyed the latest episode on Hollywood Eats. Uh, if you guys remember, that was our last episode, I believe, where we talked about all the food and dining options at uh, the Disney MGM Studios in the early years. He says one of his favorite little touches at the 50s Primetime Cafe was the dessert menu that came to you via Viewmaster. You'd pull the little lever on the side uh, and, you know, you'd see the pictures through there. This was back in 2009, so they don't do that anymore. Uh, it says, Brian, our family still mourns the loss of starring roles as well. Such a great hidden gem with great sandwiches. And, of course, the giant Butterfinger cupcake. Uh, keep up the great and always fun to listen to work. And, Brian, you replied to him and just said, yeah, the uh, Viewmaster was not an original thing, right? Well, right, because every time they would change the dessert menu, they'd have to get new ones made. So it was a – I believe it was a – 2000s thing um but it certainly went away by the time of covid it did, they did not want people handling the same viewing thing to see what the desserts are and it lets them change the menu more often now sure yeah that was it's a good idea but yeah those those custom view master slides probably add up if you're changing them frequently Okay, next up is Roderick. Uh, Roderick says, Hi guys, I love your podcast. I discovered it last year and listen while I'm on the treadmill at the gym. All right, well, here's to you, Roderick. Hopefully you're getting a mile in right now or something. 
Uh, I have a question I hope you can help me with. He lives in Jacksonville, and since 1974, his family would visit Disney World at least twice a year. On one visit, I assume around 1981 or 82, Disney had a special Florida resident preview of Epcot. My father signed us up at City Hall, and we were told to meet at the TTC monorail station after park close. When we were then we were then ushered into the monorail to Epcot. We disembarked at the Epcot station and Disney gave a presentation at the station. From what I remember there was music, dancers, and spotlights on each pavilion as its theme music played. My mother does not remember this, but my sister does. Am I crazy or did Disney do something like this before the opening of Epcot? Maybe you are crazy. Man, that's a, you know, that is a fascinating thing. Because we know the people, I mean, the, the definitely the, that tour existed where you went and, and took the monorail over to... I always thought it was just like a loop. They just drove around. They drove around. You got to get off at the platform. I, oh, I know we okay. had some. I know we had someone write in. And I don't recall ever hearing anything about any kind of presentation there. Now. Well, he having, says after park closed, though, so it had to be dark. Yeah. Now, having said that, if you signed up to see this at city hall and you went through the epcot preview center there was the model that did light up and you know had music that that played that explained probably you know what the different pavilions were so maybe he's just mashing that up i'm not saying it didn't happen i'm just saying i haven't heard of it happening but it it could be true the dancers part is the part that really gets me because could you imagine like you're a dancer and you're out there like all day Every. Was it was it like Billy? What's his name? Billy Flanagan was that Billy his name Flanagan. Up, up on the platform? Flanagan, get on the platform! Ray's up there too. <laughs> <laughs> we got to get some practice in here. So, so I know one of our listeners wrote in and told us that they um, that they got to do this. So, whoever I'm, you were, we we did get a couple of slides, uh, which are well, I was didn't get to adding them to the site today. Uh, but we got them a couple of months ago, and and Todd and I both worked on making them presentable, because it was they were like taken at twilight. But we know they used to run the monorail to the platform, so you could get out and look at Spaceship Earth and see the big construction site. This was the first time we ever got photos of it, um, of somebody actually there taking pictures of the construction site in 1981. So. It did happen. I just think you're probably meshing two memories, is my guess. But who knows if they happen to be there on some big press? Well, it could be. Thing. You know, like, did your possible. dad work for one of the sponsors, or oh, that's did a good you question, just get yeah. swept up in a in a group of GM executives and nobody noticed that your family was along <laughs> for the ride? Now, this, he did say Disney had a special Florida resident preview. Yeah, Is that, that could, could be. be well, yeah. I remember the ticket said something about Florida resident on it. There are there are some, those silver tickets, and some of them say Florida resident. So who knows, right? All right. A- anything yeah. is possible. Few things, few more or less. Blah. Anything is possible, but not everything is probable. So we'll we'll put that into a could have happened. Like the, am I crazy or does Jerry not wear glasses? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right. Thanks, Roger. Appreciate that. Uh, next one here we got from Michael. Michael and I uh, had a back and forth. Mike, here he goes by. He said, hey, guys, just uh, enjoyed listening to the food episode and have my own story regarding the sci-fi dine-in theater. He actually worked at the studios from late 90 to 92. And it was there for several openings, including Muppets 3D and the Sci-Fi. He ate there within its first week of operation, really enjoyed the whole atmosphere, and remember specifically having the popcorn soup. Did we talk about that? Popcorn soup? We, we did. We talked about it with Chef Pitts last month. Okay, that's crazy. Yeah, I just, that I must not have listened to that part of this. Uh, as we were leaving, who's walking in but Michael Eisner himself in a oh bunch of gosh. suits. Uh, just it, just suits or people wearing them. I don't know. Maybe just he had them on just like five or six them. suits over his shoulder. Yeah, he had like the little garment bag. Yeah, uh, it could have been the whole upper management team at the time, for all I knew. But I did say hi, boss, to Michael as we passed, and he asked if we enjoyed it. I told him we did and recommended the popcorn soup. I wonder if Eisner went and had a bowl of it based on uh, Mike's. 
Mike's recommendation to Mike. I'll take I'll take what Mike's having. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which I Mike? Be like the this. Mike that works here or the Mike that's the boss? <laughs> Uh, he says, this was one of several brushes with fame I had while working there. You've previously included on the podcast my story about Wolfgang Puck making my pizza order. Ma- sa- salmon, right? Didn't he make him yeah. a salmon oh, pizza? Yeah, some sort of- and then he uh, he did write me and he says, maybe one day I'll share a story how one of the new kids on the block cut me in line in front of me at the commissary salad bar. Uh, and he goes, well, I guess that's the whole story right there. And I said, <laughs> uh, we, we were back. I said, which new kid and which one do you think cut him? I'm Joey going Fatone. with Terry McIntyre, yeah. Oh, you're going with Fatone? He'd never Joey eat Fatone a salad. is not Come a on. new kid. Joey Fatone is a, is a Backstreet Boy. Whatever. Thing. Is, They're is all the same. <laughs> that kid would never eat a salad anyways. Did, he, what, see, Donnie Wahlberg. Wasn't Donnie Wahlberg a Donnie new kid? was. Yeah, see, I thought for sure it was Jordan, because he was always came across like a like a, not a nice guy, but he yeah. actually said it was... Uh, uh, J- he says, no, it was not Jordan. He was there, but Joey's the one that <laughs> cut him. I <laughs> <laughs> Joey, what was Joey's last name? McIntyre. Was right? it McIntyre? I think so. All right. Not Joey Lawrence, right? <laughs> Joey Lawrence. Edie's, Edie's son. All right. Well, thanks, Joey Mike. Bishop. We appreciate that. <laughs> All right. We're moving through here. We'll keep it going. This is from Steve. He says uh, he's been listening faithfully since 2020. We found us uh, because of our Pleasure Island episodes. Uh, as a former Disney College programmer who spent the entirety of the summer of 99 at the studios as a guide for the Backlot Tour, he has to correct our notes on what is now Pizza Rizzo. That was once the location of the Toy Story-themed Pizza Planet restaurant. Uh, he thinks he, uh, Howe mentioned the building was once used for AFI props, which is also incorrect. Uh, the AFI props were showcased at the end of the Backlot Tour where the tram part of the attraction offloaded guests. He remembers because as the summer temperatures approach 100 degrees, we cast members always made a stop at AFI to check out the What About Bob puppets and cool off <laughs> in the AC. Keep up the good work. I love what you do. He looks forward to the final Pleasure Island episode, Hal. When, so. when I read this email before Hal answers, uh, there's a scene in Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, as their uh, Kim Cattrall as a Vulcan is piloting the Enterprise out of space dock. Captain Kirk orders her to go one quarter impulse. And she says, uh, may I remind you that regulations reg- say only thrusters while in space dock. And Nichelle Nichols as Uhuru just goes like, no, you shouldn't have said that. And that was me when I read this email and said, I'm sure Hal's going to correct this fella. <laughs> so we had, we had some back and forth. <clears throat> and what I will admit is calling it the AFI student. A, putting AFI on it was incorrect. AFI only came into play once it was in that new building that was built at the end of the uh, at the end of this of the tram tour when you would get. Oh yeah, you got out. Yeah. It was like it was right there, right? You went yep. right into the building. Yep. That was so where they I unloaded. Recall pirates yeah. being in there and different things. Oh, they like that. put all Star kinds Wars. of wars. Yeah. yeah, there was some Star Wars. There was it was great. It was a great display. At one time, they had my favorite. They had several scenes set up from Night- Nightmare Before Christmas, the whole town square mm-hmm. with tons of puppets. It was phenomenal, humongous. And the kids would like rushed up to it, just trying to figure out what in the hell it was, because, you know, parents were terrified to like have their kids <laughs> see that movie at the movie theater because <laughs> uh, it just looked weird and creepy and they didn't know what to make of it. But like it was so cool. It's like everyone was just transfixed by it. And that was such a such a neat display, um, but that uh, that space was called Studio Showcase. I, w- I went back and and kept the guidebooks because you know I've got the receipts. So that <laughs> that what became Pizza Rio Pizza Rizzo was originally called the Studio Showcase, and it had a lot of those same props that ended up in the AFI one just years earlier. The rocket, yeah. you know, rocketeer costume, yep. all the stuff. Uh, eventually they built that new um, facility at the end of the tram tour and moved all the stuff over there. And the studio showcase became uh, an arcade <laughs> and, and was an arcade for a couple of years. Uh, and then it became the toy, a toy story restaurant. And then eventually became pizza Rizzo. And the, at some point Disney got the AFI affiliation for the props that were there. And that's when they renamed it to the AFI Studio Showcase. 
at the end of the tram tour. So mm-hmm. uh, I th- AFI was wrong. It was not an AFI studio showcase, but it was a it was a studio showcase there. And, and I have I know I've, I think I, I gave Todd video that I have taken inside of that place. Yeah, it's somewhere um, in the archives and probably turned over to JT's to do list. <laughs> yeah, so. so so it's in there. We ac- I actually have like a whole video walkthrough in that space uh, uh, that will co- come to YouTube at some point in the future. Well, we'll award you both two points. You you for being uh, right but wrong on the name, and him for forcing you to explain yourself. <laughs> Great work, everybody. Teamwork makes the dream work. All right. Uh, Abdul is our next uh, writer here. He says, longtime listener, one of my quick service favorites, the Studio Catering Company, right across from the Backlot Tour entrance and adjacent to the High Octane Bar on one side of Honey, I Shrunk the Kids Play Area um, on the other side was somehow missed in your show. I know y'all covering opening day restaurants and some of that opened within a year or two. Like Howard, this was my favorite since I was on a budget too. Keep up the good work. Thanks. Anybody, what's, which one's these, uh, the yeah. high octane I mean, bar? I, well, I can't speak to the octane bar. I do remember the, the quick service location because they're right next to the honey. I shrunk the kids playground, right? There was a giant like area to sit down and, mm-hmm. uh, and I remember you I feel like you walked up a tiny little incline at this food service place for some reason, almost like a ride exit when you're coming out of Muppet Vision going down that like tiny little incline. You know, so that depended entirely on what year. On how much you had drank at the Octane Bar, whether (laughs) it felt like you were going up an incline. (laughs) So the the Octane Bar wasn't there at first, but that's when you got Mm -hmm. off of the tram tour, you walked up a long sidewalk past like the Hardcastle and McCormick car and one of the, um, one of the police cars from one of the chances that there would be two (laughs) random Hardcastle and McCormick references in one night in the same show. I don't even, what is that? It was a TV show. It was a buddy cop TV show in the the eighties, but they drove like exotic cars. because That's what you did in the 1980s. You had a cool car as part of your show. So you would walk up there and then into the loony bin. And then after you walked through the loony bin, you would come out into this area. Um, this was also where the splash fountain was located. Yeah. Yep. So and the um, giant Coke bottle eventually, right? Wasn't right. Eventually. Coke and, bottle in it? Yeah. and the high, the high octane bar wasn't there originally when it opened. Cause of course cars didn't exist yet. And that's a cars reference. Um, but yeah, I, on opening day, that's, that's where we went and sat down and had some snacks uh, some Doritos and some Cokes waiting to go on the walking tour. That was your one place to like take a break between the two tours because you were back there for three and a half hours. Uh, well, once you got on the tram tour, you were back there for good. Well, we certainly didn't cover every dining establishment, but I appreciate you bringing that one up. And having brought it up, I don't want to close the mailbag, at least from the last episode's uh, feedback, without mentioning... If you listen to Chef Pitts' interview at the end of the show, several times he mentioned Larry Slocum, uh, who was the food and beverage director for the resort and eventually became the very first vice president for culinary at Walt Disney World uh, within within the Disney company anywhere. Uh, and after that episode aired, uh, actually, Larry Slocum passed away a couple of weeks ago. And I just wanted to note that for everyone, uh, how well regarded he was by all of the culinary folks from the golden era that we've talked to. Uh, he is a leg, well, I don't know if he's a legend, but he has a window on Main Street, uh, which, you know, references his uh, culinary uh, expertise. And uh, I didn't want the show to pass without us mentioning it. All right. Uh, last one here for the moment. Uh, our buddy Reese wrote us, and she says, "Hope you're resting well after a successful retro magic and Christmas movie night." Recently, came across a home video of my grandpa driving on the racetrack at Disney World that was demolished a couple years ago. I believe it was part of the TTC parking lot where the road stands. I was wondering if you could tell me about it when it was built and why. I've never heard anyone talk about this, which is surprising because it seems like it was a big piece of land. A uh, really cool experience to offer. Any knowledge would be awful, awesome. 
All right, Reese, so I'm going to give you the short version here, but uh, it's it's a fun little history, a short history. Uh, the track opened in 95, and they, they did it for, for basically indie cars, which is like an open wheel, you know, little single cockpit type car. And they had the plan to have like a, a race or two there every year because, I mean, you're at Disney World. You can have car races here, and you've got parking they built the track actually in kind of like the back corner, almost like if you're pulling under the Magic Kingdom uh, toll plaza, just look left, and it was like over there, big big parking space, and it was a tri-oval track, which means it's not a perfect oval. It had like a couple of indents in it, basically. One of the big party pieces was it had Lake Mickey on the infield. It was three circles that formed a uh, big pond, basically, and. I mean, from the start, it, it offered nightmares for Disney. The parking issue, because the first year, this is crazy to me. You imagine, you know, you're getting all excited to go to Magic Kingdom. You drive your kids in there. Well, guess what? You can't park here because there's a race today. So they diverted everybody to Epcot and made them take that monorail over. And then years later, they flip-flopped it. They made the race people park at Epcot. And the race people were like, there's a big parking lot right next to the track. Why can't we go here? The other great story I heard is which I can I can vouch for this because I've been in the position where I've heard this. If you were staying at Wilderness Lodge, which was a deluxe resort, you know, at the time, you know, probably two hundred dollars a night, I don't know, roughly, all you heard was racetrack, noise, cars, everything. Oh, yeah. I mean, and there the indie cars are a more high pitched tone. Yeah. Uh they weren't NASCAR style like a deep rumble, but you still heard them. So like people are like, you know, I dropped three grand on this trip and all I hear is race cars. And it wasn't just race day. There was qualifying, there was practicing, there was testing. It just never ended. And Disney, I guess, took a bath on it because they were just comping rooms left and right to people because of the noise. I heard a story of one guy. He would plan his trip for race week because he knew he would get it comped if he complained. <laughs> so, oh, man. so you think of all the losses on this. So then they quit with the racing for a number of reasons. Um, this track was built in an era, which it wasn't illegal, but it was before the safe, current soft safety barriers they have now. So there were a number of wrecks and injuries, which that really wasn't why it shut down or anything. But I mean, that happens in racing. I think it just was a bad feeling for Disney to have that happen. They then more moved to... Um, what your grandpa probably did, Reese, which was the B Petty experience. That opened in '97. That's where you could ride in a like a real NASCAR. You could do ride-alongs. You could do driving it. They had an Indy car experience that opened in '08, and then they opened exotic cars in 2012, which was more like Ferraris, Lamborghinis, GTRs, that sort of stuff. Final nail in the coffin um, was the big flyover that you take now when you leave. Pretty much goes right there. That was right in the way. Yeah. Um, and right at the end too, I don't think it was connected again, but one of the exotic, uh, car experiences, they spun out, crashed into a barrier. The trainer, uh, tra was tragically killed, uh, a Lamborghini Gallardo. That was 2015 and it pretty much closed right after. One thing that I wish I would have got to do is run Disney used to actually do the marathon on the, the banked track, which I mean, that sounds really lame if you don't run, but I think it would have been cool to do that. I've been in there um, because it was you could drive in there, sign a waiver, and just go watch the cars randomly during B Petty, and um, it, it was it was just unique to be like I'm at like a racetrack, but I'm at Disney World. It was just a weird feeling for me because the two never really mixed except right there. Yeah. So my, my I remember when they were building it, I was just like, this is not gonna last. <laughs> I'm surprised it lasted as long as it did. But but it was in that era when they were building everything. You know, oh, everything, we're bringing anything. the Brave Spring Training here, and we're, right, we're building right. you know right. football fields and lacrosse fields. We're gonna have and, outdoor you know, ice skating. Soon. Yeah, yeah, we're doing everything here. Uh, my was, brother, my yeah. my brother-in-law actually did the the you know drive a stock car around the thing the, oh, experience, the experience that you could yeah. yeah he did he so he was he's a you know race car guy so he he enjoyed it but yeah I, never... I, as i recall it was specifically staged a couple of weeks in january after the marathon when it was also a low point to try to fill in some of the yeah. Um, fill in some of the soft bookings that they would have at that time of the year. So it was another one of the things like the marathon in order to get people down there and fill up the hotel rooms during what was at that point an off season. Um, I mean, if you want to know like roughly what this sounds like, you could probably do this very easily if you're not a, a car person. You, you won't notice this on a NASCAR race. Like don't tune to that. But 
we, we're going to bring it up again. Go rent or stream Days of Thunder in the part when he's like testing the first car kind of at the beginning with by himself. That is the exact noise we were hearing at Fort Wilderness. <laughs> Just that like l- deep rumble and like you'd hear it come and go. And like, I mean, my dad and I thought it was cool as hell because we like cars and we're like, this is awesome. It's like, you know, they're filming a movie over here or something. But I mean, you imagine people but- that. Yeah, They're I'm, not in the mood for yeah. that. That's, and, and, and that's ima- not ideal. And, and imagine that it's Fort Wilderness, Wilderness Lodge, the Polynesian, which it was closer to than anywhere else, I think. Yep. Yeah. The the Grand Floridian. Um, <laughs> I'm you know, sure you heard it. Pr- probably too. at the Contemporary, too, well, but not maybe not as much with the concrete insulation. And you could be on the far side and people don't really open their windows there or anything, but... I mean, it, just imagine like your most expensive properties yep. all hearing this all day long. I'm well, f- and that that was only one car we heard. I can't imagine a race day. I mean, you could tell it was just one, but like a full on race day, they, it, the noise doesn't stop. I so mean, it I'm, is constant. I'm, I'm three and a half miles from downtown, and we have a Formula One race every year. And for that weekend, all you hear is yep. like all day long. And I'm Manate- three and a half miles Manate's away. Manatee's knocking on his door. Right. Listen. <laughs> They're like, knock that off. Give us some fresh water and cut that out. So I cannot imagine being right next to it like that, how loud that had to have been. That's so that's crazy. the uh that's the history, Reese. Uh, you know, I next time I see you, if you have any follow up questions, let me know. I, I, I was there. I, I never was Richard Petty. I never drove on it or anything because it just wasn't uh, worth the cost to me, but and I never saw a race there, but I, I I was always interested in the history of it because you drive out of the Magic Kingdom in that area, you'd see like you know the chain link uh, catch fences and all that, and yeah. you're like, that's a racetrack at Disney. That's really weird and cool at the same time. So, um, and how speaking of that, when I was just in Clearwater a month ago, all I wanted to do was find a garden hose and just hose hose off a of manatee. <laughs> I'm telling my wife about it. I go, gosh, there's got to be a hose around here somewhere we can feed one of these guys. <laughs> But we, we didn't do it. We couldn't find one. So uh, Next time. Next time. Yeah. All right. So that's going to do it for the mailbag. If you have any uh, questions, comments, uh, stories, pictures, video, please share them with us. Podcast at RetroWDW.com. We uh, read them all. We try to reply to them all. And there is a chance that your letter or note could end up on a future episode. So make sure you uh, tune in to catch it at might be on the next one or might be on one a year from now. You never know. Are those my clocks on you? Yeah. Uh, it's 8 o'clock. Perfect. My experiment worked. They're all exactly 25 minutes slow. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Doc. Are you telling me that it's 825? Precisely. Yeah. I'm late for school. All right, well, it's time for our main topic. As we said at the top of the show, uh, we're going to be doing a little bit of good neighbor here where we're going to take a trip down I-4. We're not going to reach 88 miles per hour because then we would see the land before this was built. But uh, how is it going to take us through Universal Studios? Great, Scott. This is a fantastic episode. And he's about to... Tell us some serious stuff. Huh? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I have a prop for this episode, by the way, and I know this is an audio podcast, yeah, but, but what do you got? Uh, if you get the reference, uh, I'm just going to crack this open here. It's got a Miller Lite there. <laughs> have my car towed all the way I'm all the way you to your been, house, and uh, all you, you have, get from me is light beer. There he goes. <laughs> now, Beth. Now Say Beth. hi to your mom for me. <laughs> There's going to be quotes and references. And uh-huh, uh-huh. I, 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 I said at some I go, I point, somebody's going, whoa, this is I, heavy, Hal. The, the, this is the heavy. funny thing is, he held that up, and I was like, that's not the kind of beer he pours into the to Mr. Fusion. With the <laughs> no, 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 that no. Was a, that was a Miller High Life. That was a Miller it? High Life. That's right. I'm yeah, going Mr. a deeper Fusion. cut from the uh, start Actually, I have one. my Mr. Fusion here. I'll have to get it, my little Mr. Fusion. I was expecting here. Todd to be drinking a Pepsi Free right now and for Brian to have a What do you mean free? To be honest. Give me a tab. You want a you want a Pepsi pal? You're gonna pay, pay for it. All right, give me a tab. You want a tab? You haven't paid for anything yet. All right, all right. Enough of the shenanigans. We will continue throughout this because one of the, my favorite movies of all time, and I, I will I, back in nineteen. Oh gosh, what year was it? I, I want to say ninety two, ninety one. I went down there with grandparents. They took us to the Hard Rock and they took us to Universal, and I 
got on that attraction. I think I think we rode it twice. It was the only time I ever got to go there and ride it. I was very disappointed when we went back and it was gone. Um, but yeah, I have a, a strong affinity for the Back to the Future trilogy, as I do think a lot of people. Uh, it's some of the most perfect films you could you could make in so many ways. And I tell you what, just don't get Google going on it because you get all these things about these articles or people looking at theories and all sorts of crazy uh, Back to I, the Future stuff. I do but. see you've poured yourself a bowl of Sophie May peanut brittle there, though. <laughs> well, Uncle Joey didn't get a jail. I'm going to bring the cake later. We can have that. <laughs> but how? Could literally do bit. this all night. I know. It's not going to end. It's not going to end. Believe me, Marty, you're better off without having to worry about all the aggravation and headaches of playing at that dance. You're absolutely right, Marty. The last thing you need is headaches. <laughs> We're going to have to eat this cake by ourselves. Your Uncle Joey didn't make parole again. So I don't know if there's anybody out there that hasn't seen Back to the Future, but if you haven't, uh, the short premise is that there's a young teenager by the name of Marty McFly, and he has a friend, uh, Doc Emmett Brown, who's kind of a very eccentric inventor in town, and Doc uh, converts a DeLorean, which was a very unique car for its time in the mid 80s uh, stainless steel body wait a minute wait a minute doc uh, are you telling me that you built a time machine out of a delorean the way i see it if you're gonna build a time machine into a car why not do it with some style besides the stainless steel construction made the flux dispersal look out <laughs> Uh, so the, the premise there is that Doc builds this time machine, uh, and then uh, by accident, we're going to see the movie. We're going to tell you, not going to tell you how, uh, but uh, Marty unfortunately goes back to 1955 and meets up with his parents. Mom, is that you? You're there now. Just relax. You've been asleep for almost nine hours now. Horrible nightmare. Dreamed that I went back in time. It was terrible. Well, you're safe and sound now, back in good old 1955. 1955? Accidentally, fall, well, his mother starts falling in love with him rather than his to-be father, so his family starts to fade from the future, and he has to get his parents to kiss, to get back together, to ensure he protects his himself from actually being there, because... Look! There's a rhythmic ceremonial ritual coming up. Of course! The Enchantment Under the Sea dance! They're supposed to go to this! That's where they kiss for the first time! All right, kid. You stick to your father like glue, and make sure he takes you to that dance! Uh, there were two sequels, where Marty goes into the future, and then also the Marty goes uh, and Doc go back uh, to the to the old wild wild west, uh, eighteen eighty five. Um, there, there were not supposed to be two sequels, but the first was so successful that they. It said the end originally in the original theatrical release. It said the end when it came out on video. It said to be continued okay. because by that point they had decided to. This was good. Go ahead and make the sequels plural and film them at the exact same time for two and three the actor's convenience because michael j fox who was a marty mcfly big star on family ties the television series and yeah. uh attempting to branch out into movies at the time and uh christopher lloyd uh, who played dr emmett brown uh, was an in-demand actor as well so they just decided let's lock these all up and do them do them right now and uh, I won't ask for everybody's ranking on them. I mean, if the original is by far, I mean, they're, oh, yeah. they're all good. Uh, but the original is as close to a perfect movie as you get. Yeah. yeah. And there's a bad guy too, right? There's there is a, a bad guy, Biff Tannen. Biff Tannen. He's, Biff he's Tannen. your typical bully. I mean, that's that's who he yeah. is. He bothers uh, the family, it seems like, at every turn and every generation. A Tannen does somehow, it seems like. Hey, I'm talking to you, McFly, you Irish bug. Oh, hey, Biff. Hey, guys. How are you doing? Yeah, you got my homework finished, McFly? Uh, well, actually, I figured since it wasn't due till Monday. Hello? Hello? Anybody home? Hey! Think, McFly. Think. 
I gotta have time to recopy it. You realize what would happen if I hand in my homework in your handwriting? I'll get kicked out of school. You wouldn't want that to happen, would you? So if you haven't <laughs> seen it, go pause this, mm-hmm. go watch the trilogy, come back. Actually, all you have to watch the first one. Yeah, you really well, only need it, to see And what's the first good about one. this, and, and why you know I thought this, you know, that movie you can tell like was probably my favorite movie as a you know as a young preteen, and then mm-hmm. the fact that they go, guess what? You can come to Florida and do a whole ride based on this, and you were just oh, like, yeah. like I was so excited to see this and do it. Yeah, that is the same thing that the four people who loved avatar said oh my god i can go to pandora in animal kingdom all four of them like and we can get a tail i can get a tail finally i get a little thing for my shoulder right i can shoulder banshee i can go to fruit of bowls cafeteria over here and get Mm -hmm. a bowl of noodles just like i'm in space just like eating pandora food Right. And you still can't get an obtainium. They don't have it in the gift shop. So it's the it's most expensive, perfect environment nobody ever cared about. <laughs> Next to Galaxy's but I, Edge. But I but I digress. <laughs> Universal the, invites the, us to ride the movies, as they would say. Yeah. Now, Absolutely. Bi- no, I think the big thing is that this movie was a massive, massive hit. It opened at number one held that position for three weeks, dropped to number two in its fourth week against uh, National Lampoon's European Vacation, and then went back to number one for an additional eight weeks. Wow. So it, yeah, was, it had legs. I mean, it, it, was, it, was, it dominated that year. I mean, it just dominated 1985. Dominated it. And, the, you know, Huey Lewis in the News, it's like the two songs that were in that movie, you know, Power of Love and Back in Time were huge radio hits. It was just such a big deal. Um, I'm afraid you're just too darn loud, Hal. It's... I'm afraid you're just too darn loud. Next place. <laughs> Pe- Pepsi commercials. There were Pepsi commercials from the movie. What's wow. interesting is that merchandising came a lot later too. There, there wasn't, you know, you didn't see the toys and all that stuff. It didn't hit that. that I, you picture. know, I think they expected it to do well, but I, I don't, I don't think. I mean, how can you ever well, know whether something's going to hit the zeitgeist where it becomes right. like a big part of the culture? Wasn't oh, yeah, it though absolutely. like a problem though, kind of like Jaws in a sense, like because they they uh, recast absolutely they recasted yeah, they, the from Eric Stoltz start, to uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Michael J. Fox, and then yep halfway through yeah, I mean there's they, so much well, only a couple of weeks, but yeah, it was a couple <laughs> weeks in and when the, they decided it wasn't working, and originally Michael J. Fox couldn't get out of family ties and then by the time they realized eric stoltz wasn't working and they were going to have to reshoot everything michael j fox was available then because they had wrapped family ties for the for the for the season but uh now was this opening day at universal no it was not it was the following year right it was much like horizons it was the building was under construction what when universal's open but they were not finished with the ride yet what year was it uh so it it so Universal opened in 1990, okay, and the ride opened in 1991. And, and then when did Part okay. Two come out? The film? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to. Oh. Is was it like timed closely? They were like eight, eight, 89 and 90, I think, were the two films. So we're, yes, we're right so, so the, Part Two and Part Three. What, what a yeah, thing by, too with the traction coming out. Like we're so used to the movie coming, and then they decide five years later to put it at Disney. Like this was coming out right when it was pretty hot you know as far well as... back to oh, now back to future came out in 1985 yeah. ride didn't open until 1991 but two so and three one... i'm saying were, were coming so it was still yes so it did and and as we'll get into it it's like the delay in getting those movies out actually really helped was a benefit to the ride in a, in a big way had had they actually started earlier it probably wouldn't have had the same story that it did when when it was done so Let's get into that. Yeah, let's, yeah. let's, let's get start into talking that. about that. We've talked more about um, the movie than the ride, and this yeah. is Back to the Future: The Ride. <laughs> Doc, Marty, you made it! Yeah. Welcome to my latest experiment. This is a big one, the one I've been waiting for all my life. 
Ah, uh, well, it's a DeLorean, Stay right? Stay with me, Marty. All your questions will be answered. Roll yeah. tape. Okay, I'll right. proceed. Ah, uh, Doc, uh, is that a Bebo? Never mind that now. Never mind that right. now. Not now. Not now. All right, so let's, some to let's toss some garbage into Mr. Fusion and set the DeLorean's time circuits to May 2nd, 1991, the day that the Back to the Future ride opened at Universal Studios Florida. So... After paying your admission price of $30.74 for adults or $24.38 for kids, you quickly walk up the fake Hollywood streets towards the old filming sense of Swamp Thing. And directly across the lake from Jaws is a massive six-story building which had been under construction from the park's opening day but is now open. As you pass the Animal Actors Stage and the International Food and Film Festival restaurant, you can finally see the building clearly. The Institute of Future Technology is open and visitors are streaming in to see all the amazing things that Dr. Emmett Brown, founder and chief inventive officer, has been working on. Thank God. Thank God it's open because Jaws is closed because it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> they were fixing it. <laughs> that, building, that, is... that building is so pop 80s early 90s with the colors and the oh, design it the is glass just block glass block oh, like yes. 18 feet of it it's just huge oh yeah. my god I, and I love that jt says that as there's a glass block window behind <laughs> it's my basement yeah <laughs> i love it i need to glow there was pink. also there was also a neat gag across the street if you remember when universal opened they had these basically picture spots where they would have these like forced perspectives and different things mm -hmm. to like make your pictures look so there was across the lake there was a model of a space shuttle on this apparatus and if you stood in the right place and stood your family in front of it it looked like the institute of future technology was actually a space shuttle launch pad and the space shuttle was sitting on top of it so uh anyways oh oh, oh todd's got a picture of it there it is there you go my grandmother cut off the top of the launch pad but uh if she got idea. a very good shot of Todd and his brother. Exactly. Or... Wait, that's I'm real? Todd. There was a space it... shuttle on top of that? <laughs> <laughs> it's just the force perspective. It's perfect, though, isn't it? I it's mean, amazing. It looks great. I'm so the confused. Norwegian, the Norwegian <laughs> flag is very prominent here. The, Nor right. yeah, the Norwegian flag. Yeah. Well, so, it's the International Institute. You know? So, know. so that, that area was called Expo Center or something. And that was the the theme. So you had the Institute of Future Technology. You had the International Food and Film Festival, which was like their quick serve restaurant. Actually, it wasn't a quick serve. It was a tick freaking forever serve from the times that I went there. <laughs> but it was a, a, it was a cafeteria style. And then the Animals Actor Stage and E.T. were all part of this like expo. It's area. so funny that Todd's like, oh, it just screams late 80s because it literally looks like they took the paint left over from Wonders of Life and just <laughs> slapped <laughs> it, it on this that. building. <laughs> it was on <laughs> sale Bring it over Sherman there. Williams. <laughs> we got it at property control over at Disney. <laughs> so as as you enter the twisting outdoor queue that's shared by that's shaded by many ramps leading upwards, you can't help but notice the many, many televisions running videos that give you the history of the Institute oh, yeah. and Doc Brown. Uh, he's on his way back from the year 2015, and he promises to take us on our own time travel adventure one day into the future. <laughs> but as we make our way through the queue and up the ramps, not as all as it seems to be. Biff Tannen, the villain of the Back to the Future movies, has stowed away on a DeLorean piloted by an Institute team conducting an experiment in 1955, and he has returned to the present to cause trouble and get his revenge on Doc Brown. Okay, so I got my it, it, first time problem here. When was this supposed to take place? What year? The year that you're there. 1991. Oh, but the, so the last DeLorean was destroyed at the end of three, so... What DeLorean did he steal? Was that ever solved? I feel like he mentions show? something about it. Like, well, he says it because it's a special well, modified yeah. DeLorean, or he has. Is that what it is? He made another. But one? he does Wait. have the like the two passenger one there. But again, here now here is where we go. This attraction was under development before the events of Back to the Future two and three took place. Right. Oh, were so they? They okay. didn't. So they didn't know at when they started doing this that that DeLorean would be destroyed. But before. As before we solve Todd's time continuing problem for him, can I can I jump back? You mentioned the ramps to get up there. Yes. 
And I just want to say on behalf of chubby, out of shape people like myself, they really made you work to get into this ride. Like it was, you know, like I felt like them people to climb the Matterhorn at Disneyland. Like by the time you finally got to the ride entrance. <laughs> and you would just, I mean, and the line would take a long time when it first opened up, especially when the lines are huge. Yeah. Or even for the first five, six years, it's like you waited for so long outside well, this was there was no fast pass and it was also in the era too where like it was actually impressive that there was all those tvs because before that there was no entertainment so you're like oh, i at least watch tv when i was there you know oh, yeah, smartphone yeah. but you know right. they they it did have a pre-show too so like that was a help but like Except you got to see it on a loop over and over again on the hanging screen. Now, now, the other thing, too, is I just realized my Blu-ray over here of uh, Back to the Future, it does have this ride on it. I, sh- I should have watched it tonight. It, I didn't think of that. It, it, it does. There is a little bit cut out of yeah. it, though. Mm-hmm. Um, but it does have the uh, – it does have, you did, the ride footage is out there as a uh, – I think on the was it the twenty fifth anniversary edition or thirty? I think so. One yes. of the edi- one of the editions included it, yep. which we're probably jumping an hour ahead on house notes. So as we make our way into the building, we're sent down a hall and into a room to wait. And there's like these cages on the side that just it just looks like somebody went to Minecraft and bought whatever junk crap electronics yeah. they could have and piled it <laughs> along the side. But it's glorious. Uh, and also some clocks of like the time in Orlando and Greenwich and Hill Valley and a couple places. So, you know, some neat stuff. Oh, JT's got his 25th anniversary. Yeah, that's what I thought it was. I, I don't know what I have in there. I have a trilogy Blu-ray set. Um, and so uh, after we wait for a little bit at that holding point, which is exactly the same way that The Simpsons works today, you're sent down a hall past a bunch of doors of you know in people that work at the institute and other places into a little room to wait and the room inside was actually pretty cool because there were all kinds of schematics of some of doc's inventions plus all kinds of objects like a hoverboard and a plasma ball which was still really neat back then um one of the save the clock tower flyers was like up on a bulletin board inside behind glass so it had a lot of really great references to the movie and then a television comes on and Doc Brown continues his presentation. Uh, and he tells us all about his greatest invention, the eight passenger DeLorean time vehicle. Uh, and as he's telling us about that, Biff sneaks into the office and hits a switch, like breaks, breaks a switch with a monkey wrench, triggers an alarm and it drops steel bars around his office, trapping him inside. Biff steals a DeLorean to take it for a joyride. And Doc Brown is ready to give chase, except he's trapped in his office like a rat. And then he remembers he can have us, the volunteers, get into the eight passenger DeLorean to act as navigators while he steers by remote control. Here goes the trope that we like. You have to get it. This is the same thing as Countdown to Extension. You're involved. We really don't need. We could control this thing all by ourselves, but we just want you to go along. (laughs) Like for no reason, we're gonna put your life in jeopardy. It 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 just doesn't make sense. Right. Uh, It's Uh, always bothered me. Like ah, I'm like Pee Wee Herman at at the Alamo. Oh, come on. Uh, and if here's the deal now, if if we can do this. And we can bump into Biff's car while going 88 miles an hour. It'll create a time vortex and it'll send both cars back to the present day and back to the Institute, saving everybody. So so that's it. That's our mission. We, we got our mission. Uh, we got it. We got to do this. Oh, oh, by the way, in case you're wondering how how do we find Biff through time? Because he's jumping through. Good news. The car has been outfitted with a, with a sub ether time tracking scanner and we'll know not only where and when in time Biff is, but also his exact location. So we got that covered. It's all good. All right. So we're good. Yep. The door opens up. The door opens up to the adjacent room, revealing the DeLorean. And I, as a Back to the Future fan, that is such a cherry moment of... Oh the gull wing doors and you're like oh i get to get into the delorean this even though it had no awesome. glass and no roof but it still didn't matter listen todd like, you had to enjoy it at that age come on you, oh i'm so are you kidding me on. i was just over it, the moon it, it was the convertible model todd exactly. because 
when you know what's going to happen in the future, you only go on sunny days. So there's no need. <laughs> there's no need for yeah. I for know the glass. Right. Right. Yeah, why why travel to the future on an unpleasant day? First, you've got to get out and change clothes. Right now, it's pouring rain. Wait five more seconds. Right on the tick. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Too bad the post office isn't as efficient as the weather service. I was totally amazed when we got in that car because I remember at that age and that time having the little screen with Doc on it and the buttons that I feel I don't oh, remember yeah. if the buttons did something. I feel like they did and they weren't like Mission Space where they were like dummy buttons, like it actually like changed screens or something, but I could be wrong. Yeah, I don't know. It was fun. And and having the flux capacitor right there in the front where you could see it instead of in the back. Ah, uh, yes. You were just like, oh, this is this is authentic. This is the real deal. This is yeah, some hydrolator stuff right here. The fact that you the time right circuits here. and, uh, uh, you know, this is right. where you are. This is where you're going. This is where you're Right. Going. It had that display. It had yeah. all the good stuff. Some speakers, stereo speakers, everything you needed. Um, so you climb in. The lap bar comes down. They perform some last minute system checks. Uh, and there's in front of us a retractable garage door. Well, just like the one that we had just seen Biff open up and then go through to take off. But when it's time for us to go, instead of moving forward through the door, the car lifts off vertically. <laughs> yeah. And we rise up into the air through a puff of smoke and everyone's just like, whoa, we're flying. This is the best thing ever. And if I recall, when you when you went up, didn't the garage door drop down a little bit and then they pushed you out? I, or was I don't. Ju- or did you just rise up? I think up? you just rise up and come, like kind of come forward a little bit. A little bit, right. Because they, and I think the door dropped be- went, or went down because they had to be able to t- pivot you. So, because right as you right as you hit the top, you do your first lurch backwards and you accelerate to eighty eight and you make your first jump through time. Yep. So as and as that phys- and the physical smoke in the room is kind of that buffer between the screen and you because you couldn't see that you had moved up into the screen. So by the time the smoke is fading away and the screen is on doing the time travel effect. Right. It, it's all happening very organically. So there's not like this cut between you and the car. And then it just seems very natural. And that smoke covers a lot of stuff as the ride goes on. It was very, oh, yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> really, it's, really, it really key. helpful. Yep. Um, and so we accelerate to 88 and we make our time leap forward to the amazing year 2015. Because that's, you know, that was the, that was the future right there. So thanks to the sub ether time tracking scanner. We arrive in Hill Valley just moments behind Biff, even though he had a head start. So this is the thing that you'll see over and over again, even though Biff gets to take off in front of us because we've got this sub ether time tracker. We can come in kind of right behind him and parallel to him when we jump back into his time stream. It's funny. Um, that's definitely something they had to put in there because otherwise I know there'd be a lot of people. It'd be worse today if it was on Twitter because everybody would be figuring out all the the time warp challenges of this well you would you would show up and like biff would be gone and how the hell would you ever find him right realistically this guy's got like a minute and a half head start (laughs) how would you ever through all of these things you know it's the battle star galactica thing oh they warp someplace it's like how are you supposed to know where they where they are or when they are right so uh so we end up in hill valley 2015 we kind of fly through a previously unseen part of the city narrowly avoiding collision with a tanker truck we enter the courtyard square and we see the famous clock tower. Biff takes off down a side road. Doc's crazy piloting crashes us through a glass Texaco sign. Extremely a, realistic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a good thing we're in the convertible and yet none of the glass hit us. So that was fortunate. Uh, and then we go down a side road. We crash through another sign and go through a residential. And all these sign crashes are covering edits in the film where they need to transition from like one you know, one model set up to another model set up. You go down a side road, crash into another sign, and then we go to a residential area. We make like a weird, quick little time jump for some reason. I think just because they didn't coordinate it well. (laughs) And then (laughs) we head back into the courtyard square and we see Biff take off into another time. Crazy docks, piloting seals, crash us right into the famous clock. And there's these gears and these mechanisms of the clock falling around us as we 
you know, head off to the next place. And all while happens too, don't forget, you've got the speed indicator up on the dash and that's changing too in, in sync. Right. Um, you see the jaw. I love it. You see the jaws marquee on top that of that marquee. Yeah. 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 Uh, and then we end up in the ice age. It's still Hill Valley, except everything's, you know, cold. Icy. Um, it's icy. Yeah, exactly. Um, we're a million years in the past. You can tell because the clock says zero, 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 zero on it when on the year. I guess there was no like negative <laughs> thing on the LEDs. Um, Biff plays a game of cat and mouse with us in the ice caverns. And then he takes off once again for another time destination. Our car stalls and we begin to drop down this kind of big giant ice cavern. But fortunately, Doc is able to remote start the car again. And we go backwards, hit 88 miles per hour, and we go forwards in time while traveling backwards in the car. Um, and then we end up in primeval Hill Valley, where there's a giant volcano that's erupting in front of us. So we follow Biff into the erupting volcano, and we see a dinosaur, uh, a T-Rex, and we narrowly avoid his tail, we glide forward and then there's a second T-Rex. Um, and that dinosaur smashes his head into Biff's DeLorean and kind of sends it off spinning. And when we get too close to his mouth, the dinosaur swallows us up whole. And it's interesting because that gag is actually continued in the Simpsons ride where <laughs> um, baby uh, Maggie like eats us in the same way. So that the reason she does that is an homage to the uh, back to the future ride that was there before uh somehow we're able to back out out of its mouth and escape we drop to the floor of the volcano and an enormous lava field and then we find out that biff is in trouble uh the impact knocked out his flux capacitor and then he starts begging us for help uh really which well is, by the which way which is the which is the thing that makes time travel possible that's right if without the flux capacitor he's he's stuck in the dinosaur age forever uh his car goes over a lava waterfall a lava fall and then finally we get the the chance to complete our mission we accelerate to 88 miles per hour we bump his car and it sends us both back into the present we fly into the front of the institute we crash through a large back to the future sign which of course isn't there in real life the building is a model of the building that we go into but it doesn't look exactly the same, but I guess close enough. Like who, who, who's, you know, counting. Uh, and then uh, as we crash through, we see Biff's car kind of slide in under you, ours. You know how, just so you know, in Soren, when you land in Disneyland at Christmas time, but you're in Florida, that's actually an homage to <laughs> smashing through a Back to the Future <laughs> sign that's not there. <laughs> uh, uh. Uh, so Biff, Biff's car kind of spins out and crashes. There's like a big spark and a jump cut. And then, uh, people from the Institute come out and, you know, fire, put it with fire extinguishers and kind of spray things down. Uh, and then the security takes Biff out of the car and he thanks us for saving them. And he's like, Doc Brown, thanks for saving me, you butthead. And then he insults him anyways at the end as everything kind of goes away and he's shouting and then our car goes back down and then we are able to come out doc brown reminds us is that the future is what we make it and that he tells us and i, lo I love this bit and though um, I, I don't know how many people caught this he tells us that he's returned us to the precise time that we arrive to start the adventure so we have to get out of the room quickly otherwise the doors will open and we will meet ourselves as we walk in <laughs> To get into the ride. That is so, so brilliant. Yeah. I think that was like, if you lingered, I think a little bit long in the hallway, that was one of the things that was like timed out to play to like try to get you to get your stuff and go. That's, so, that's yeah. absolutely brilliant. Really, really nice little bit. Um, so how did we get here? Um, so obviously film, huge hit. Everybody loves it. Um, but what's kind of interesting is there was this, a real kind of start stop in how Universal Studios came to be in Orlando. 
So MCA, who was the parent company at the time of Universal, uh, had actually dropped its 1984 plans to build a studio tour on the property that it had purchased in Orlando. Um, but a chance meeting of a giant ape and an even bigger film director would end up setting plans uh, for Universal Orlando to back into motion. And I actually managed to stumble across uh, a 1984 plan of Universal, and it was very much like the California version. Yeah, I was going to say we should probably mention the California Studio Tour, which is a hybrid working movie studio that they added a theme park <laughs> element attraction to. Um, I, I don't know if you. I mean, I, I've only been there once. Yeah, I mean, so. I think it's. I think it's. It it is one of the oldest studio attractions in the world, and it started out very much just as a studio tour. Right. Here's you. You got on the tram. They would take you through the back lots. Hey, here's where we filmed Ben Hur. Here's where we yeah. filmed, you know, Hunchback in Notre Dame. Here's where we filmed this. And they added the town square later on to look like Hell Valley, or was it actually filmed there? Do you recall? It was. It was filmed there. That town square yeah. set has had been on Universal's it, property, and they just kept changing it. for yes, a it's long. In, time. It's in. Well, isn't it? Isn't isn't it in Gremlins too? It's I in think? Gremlins. Yeah. It's, it's, oh yeah. Um, the the first time that I recognized it, it, it's in two episodes of The Twilight Zone. Yeah. And I'm trying to remember if it's in the first episode of The Twilight Zone or not. But there's this, there's one episode where William Shatner, uh, there's like this devil head napkin dispenser that tells you the future and the town is in there. And there's another, and I could be wrong on that one, but that's all I, I remember. There's another episode where a guy mysteriously ends up in this town all by himself and it's empty and it, it's it's a standing set that they used for many many things yeah and they would re, they would redress it as you know as was needed for for back to the future they put a bunch of you know 1950s stuff in it and set it in that time period and then when they when they when it was the 2015 uh hill valley they like redressed it to look like that yeah. and then they eventually pulled it all down and and you know made it back to what it was before right so. and over and over time they added pieces of the uh, i guess the theme park onto the movie studio lot right and you know made it made it part of it so there's still the tram tour i remember when i took it the uh the back lot set that we drove through was for um was the Ted Danson show they were making about heaven and hell? Um, oh, the comedy. Oh, the, com um, the good place. The good place. The oh, good yeah, place. Yeah. They were in the middle of production of the good place. They weren't actually shooting that day, but you could recognize the town from how the set was dressed. Um, you know, that's what I remember from that tour. And, you know, they drive you into what I guess is the Fast and Furious and became the king kong attraction now yes. in universal florida right where they, right basically they drive your tram into a 360 movie <laughs> surrounding tunnel stone yeah so yeah. there were i mean there were a number of it you know it started off with sort of like some special effects areas so they would do like the parting of the red sea and they would have some sort of device that would make the water disappear from in front of the tram so you could drive through it and then when Jaws came out, they added a Jaws element to where you were driving down, you know, the side of this thing and the shark would kind of pop up from the side and yep. scare you. Um, there was a the thing that became the King Tong King Kong tunnel was like a it's the illusion that I think they have at some like Ripley's Believe It or Not style places where like the tunnel is spinning and you're inside of it and it oh, makes yeah. you feel Ab sort of absolutely. Queasy. In fact, yes. you have to we close your it, eyes uh, after a yeah. while, too. It's like, whoa. Yeah. We have one at uh, Six Flags Great Adventure. There's an attraction there where the thing just swings back and forth, but the illusion is you're going, th you know, 360 degrees turning around, and it is called Houdini's something or other. Yes, and that actually ended up on an episode of The Six Million Dollar Man where he meets Bigfoot. <laughs> oh, I, he met Bigfoot several times. Uh, there was a um, Battlestar Galactica uh drive drive through part of it where there were cylons and mm -hmm. and good guys and um oh my gosh what else earthquake there was a yep. 
you drive the tram next to it and all that stuff would happen. So yeah, so they would add a little bit of little bits of attractions here and there. Um, and that was rough, really what was going to be built in Orlando. Part of, part of the thing was, you know, live shows like, you know, the post-production show and the animal actors, but more than a larger part of it was that kind of back lot driving tour. So it was uh, intended to be a working movie. Studio. It was intended to as, as it was when it opened. Right. But it had all of the back lot stuff that was in California would have been in Orlando. It would have had the town square set. It would have had the hunchback like old set. It would have had Dracula's castle. It would, it was almost a virtual copy of what was in California at the time. Even the Battlestar Galactica thing, you know, 1984 Galactica had been off the air for, you know, five, six years. And I don't even know if anybody cared, but they, they were going to build it. Um, it had the Jaws thing where you, were, yeah, it had an Animal House uh, fraternity row. I am not even, <laughs> but, you know, it was, but those plans died um, largely because the universe or MCA at the time was not large enough to be able to fund that by themselves. That's the reason that it, they ended up pitching Paramount <laughs> that allegedly Michael Eisner saw the presentation and then eventually took that stuff and decided to do Disney MGM because they were looking for partners to help pay for it. These companies were exceedingly small. Even Disney at that time were not the huge mega corporations they are today. Um, so that those plans died out. Uh, but according to the creative director and producer, Peter Alexander, um, they were finalizing the programming of the King Kong encounter show in June of 1986. So that's the one that Bob Gurr worked on where the, the tram drives up and a helicopter crashes and starts on fire. And then there, you're supposed to be on the Brooklyn bridge and there's a big giant Kong figure and he's got the banana breath, um, that thing. So they were finalizing the programming of that show for debut of Jude of 1986 in California. And he looked up and he saw director Steven Spielberg driving a golf cart into the building on the lower lot of the Universal <laughs> site there. And as it turns out, the two of them were college roommates, but actually hadn't seen each other since they had graduated. So Alexander ran the show for Spielberg and he was incredibly impressed by what he saw. Uh, Spielberg mentioned that his friend George Lucas had taken him on a test ride of Star Tours at Imagineering. So this is 1986. Star Tours comes out, you know, a few months later. But, um, you know, George and George Lucas and Steven Spielberg were buddies working on, you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark and a bunch of things. So George got Steven Ryan. Uh, and um, Lucas actually teased Spielberg saying, you know, it's too bad you're working with Universal. They'll, they'll never be able to do anything like this. <laughs> and so after seeing what Universal was actually capable of doing, Spielberg got really excited. Um, he initiated meetings with the MCA executives, Sidney Scheinberg and Jay Stein. Um, on January 20th, 1987 of the next year, Spielberg signed a contract with MCA, naming him as the creative consultant to Universal Studios Florida. So this was the push that MCA needed to have the parks go forward. They're like, hey, if Steven Spielberg thinks this is cool, this is cool. Maybe it's time to like get this stuff off the back burner and make it happen. And now we have access to Steven Spielberg's movies and properties. Like he's one of the hottest directors. Um, they, in exchange for a percentage of the park's admission and merchandise sales to be paid out every year in perpetuity, Spielberg, Spielberg would bring his expertise to review plans for the new park, which was then fast tracked to open in 1988. But more importantly, um, this would give him access to all of Spielberg's incredibly popular, incredibly popular IP uh, from his movies, as well as things that Amblin Entertainment was making. So that's Jaws, E.T., An American Tale, and Back to the Future. Um, work on the attraction began in earnest in 1988. The Back to the Future sequels hadn't been written yet, so there wasn't a lot of additional material to work from. They, you know, threw around a bunch of potential storylines like Doc Brown has an evil twin and just all <laughs> kinds, you know, just whatever the most normal, boring things that you could think of that 
something to kickstart stuff. Um, but just, it really wasn't getting anywhere. Um, they eventually hired two writers, Mark Cohen and Peyton Reed onto the project in 1989. Uh, now those people had actually worked on behind the scenes documentaries on back to the future two and three while they were building, being filmed. And Peyton also wrote and directed the secrets to the back to the future trilogy starring Kirk Cameron, that special that came out, uh, to promote the, I think when back to the future three came out. So those guys, you know, knew back to the future forwards and backwards. They had good relation working relationships with Bob Gale and Robert Zemeckis, the writer of the film and the director of the film. So they knew what to do. It was um, Peyton Reed who finally cracked the code and came up with the storyline of the 1955 Biff stealing the DeLorean uh, and then having the tourists go out to try to catch up with them and bring back to the present. You know, Biff was considered, you know, a minor character, important in the first one. But by time, you know, two was written, he was like the, their big bad. So, it, of course, it would make sense to use him on this attraction as you know the the antagonist um interesting enough this Peyton guy um he he still makes movies uh maybe you've heard of a, a little movie called ant-man so he wrote and directed uh, the ant-man movies but this this was his start into things um he also worked on the live action um segments uh writing for Christopher Lloyd, uh, the um, Back to the Future um, cartoon series that came out. There were some interstitials with like live action Christopher Lloyd in there and, and Bill Nye, the science guy. And, and so and if you if you want to talk about prescient timing, I mean, if this had been a 1981 or 82 movie, you wouldn't have been trying to make a ride out of it 10 years later, probably, although they made King Kong and some of that. But that that simulator technology is the only thing that you could apply to make like like what else would you make a back to the future ride about so interestingly enough allegedly there was there were some ideas for doing a roller coaster which i haven't seen artwork for but that was one thought um i have seen artwork though um done by the production designer for back to the future two and three that look an awful lot like a dark ride to me. There's a line of what looks like maybe two or four passenger DeLoreans and people getting into it and out of it. And those, yeah, those I mean, I guess if you did like the mummy style where it's an indoor coaster with some show scenes that, you know, not like rock and roller coaster where you're going so fast that, you know, could be anything. <laughs> right. Right. Um, you know, uh, yeah, I guess that would work. Yeah. You even, know, I, even this was prior to induction launchings to where you could actually go 88 really fast, which would have been cool. So it just, you know, you're right. It, it was really the perfect culmination of like all of the films being developed. The right technology was out there. It all worked and it all made sense. It was, you know, Perfect. Oh, if Universal had sponsored Test Track, though, can you imagine that? And you hit 88 miles per hour and then you shoot out into something? The sparks. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, does anybody, and I know it's on YouTube, I'm sure if I look it's there, but starting around, what, maybe 1988, every Universal movie you rented at, at the movie store uh, cause we, I you mean, know, you'd started to buy stuff, but you only bought like the big blockbusters, but you know, the, the videos, home videos originally didn't have trailers or commercials. And then sometime on the back half of the eighties, like they would sneak on a trailer and then you'd start getting like a Pepsi commercial and then a trailer and then eventually, and then it got ridiculous. Disney might even be responsible for that because everybody you know coming soon to walt disney own video coming soon to theaters and there'd be like eight minutes of stuff beforehand but i remember before universal films that you would rent there would just be this scroll across the screen that, that would eventually spell universal studios florida and i think had the logo but it was like a one minute build up to you know coming to or you know 
Now, the people who have brought you the magic of Hollywood for over 75 years want to bring it to you like no one else can. To take you inside the heart of a working motion picture and television studio to watch real filmmaking in action and share the secrets, the spectacle, the glamour that have made not only great entertainment, but entertainment history. Universal Studios Florida, premiering in Orlando, spring 1990. It's the greatest Hollywood production ever. I mean, at the end of it, all I wanted to do was go to that place. Like, I'm like, this looks like the coolest place on the planet. Well, they had so much going for them. They had the the, the movies that you know weren't they weren't Disney movies. I mean, they had like Back to no, the Future. No, they were blockbusters. They, they were adult movies. E. They were blockbusters. Con, you know, all these big ones. And then on top of it, it was like I don't know about you guys, but for me, it's like I talk about the, the MGM Studios. It was like it was behind the scenes, but you could live it. You know, it was just like such a cool idea. It, it was really it ride the movies yeah the, yeah kind of yeah. Like yeah. The and it, yeah and it really underscored why it was so important for michael eisner to make his deal with george lucas and get indiana jones and get star wars it's like an and, arms race know. almost yeah well right yeah. to get things that he could put in there and um you know and that that he thought could compete with jaws and king kong and back to the future and I just remember all the billboards coming in, you know, in the yeah. when you oh, the, they oh, had the best the billboards. billboards it was all the same font, all the same format. Ride the movies, and it had like stuff, you know, exploding past the billboard. The, the Ghostbusters, you know, all that stuff. Yeah, all those dimensional billboards yeah. were fantastic. How did you see the concept on this? Where Todd, you'll appreciate this. Uh, Einstein was supposed to be driving the DeLorean. That was one of the concepts that didn't get used. Oh, really? <laughs> and, and I'll tell you, cinema, films, uh, movies, trailers, all that stuff combined has never been the same since they've lost that deep announcer voice. There was the one guy that did them all, but like, gosh, it puts so much importance Don on La it. Fontaine. Yes, like just, in, a, in a world. Yes, like in the, mm-hmm. I don't even know who this guy was talking on here, but it just has a it has a presence. It's like I need to go there. This guy's telling me I have to go there. That's awesome. Yeah, it, Good stuff. and that and that was like I said for for a couple of years before the park opened when you'd go to rent Home Alone, wasn't Home Alone a Universal movie, I think, right? Um, was it maybe? No, that's Fox. Mm-hmm. Fox, all right. Well, anything. I mean, pick something from 88, 89, you know, anything that was universal movie, uh, you know, you'd rent it. And they this scroll was was always one of the things that ran before whatever you rented was was started. And you're just like, man, this place looks great. So <laughs> when I finally got back there in 1995, I, I Rob would be able to correct me because he knows our days. But I think we might have even gone to Universal first. I just remember it was buy one day, you get a second day for, for two days, or you get two days free or something. And it didn't, back then, like Disney, they didn't expire. So I used my unused Universal days like 10 years later. That's awesome. And and paid like $12 a day or something. <laughs> That's and like then, the SeaWorld. Remember I walked up to SeaWorld. I had the, yeah. the, the, they're like, yeah. You can use these. Yeah, just you can back. use this ticket from 1977 for $2.33 $2. or something. Yeah, just turn it in. We'll <laughs> no lay deal. in. That's, that's, but yeah, they, they. but Universal stopped the uh, non-expiration tickets long before Disney did. All right, so we got this. We got the writing going on. Meanwhile, Peter Alexander was working with teams of contractors to bring the physical show to life. They hired a company called Smith Bruni Industrial Design to create the eight passenger DeLorean time vehicles. Those would be outfitted with a simulator uh, simulator motion base and raised on lifts in front of an IMAX Omni or an IMAX Omnimax dome. The same kind of screens used at Horizons at Epcot. So those are cut from the same cloth, just a few years, you know, between each other. Uh, to prove that the idea would work. Alexander rented an IMX theater in Las Vegas and brought a foam core mock-up of the vehicle for people to sit in to prove that with the doors blocking the side views, the riders would look straight ahead at the movie and not get freaked out, like looking at left and right at the other DeLoreans like next to them. Although I have to say, if you ever got a chance to do that in the ride, it was very cool to look sideways. Yes. 
and see all of these other DeLoreans yeah. like floating yeah. up around you. And they were all moving in sync, so it was it was really odd because you'd get this like they were all moving at the same time. It was really really I, really I, cool. I, my first yeah, ride, was... uh, I didn't notice, and then years later, when I was older and more aware of how like theme parks worked, you look out and you're like, "Ooh, that's weird!" Like it's like too many yeah, DeLoreans. Like, hey, there they are. There they are. Look at that. <laughs> it's it's almost uh, like if you could see star tours happening, or you know, you could do it on uh, uh, back at Brian's favorite land in Pandora. You look out, you know, during the you know you're not supposed to uh, with the the Banshee flight. You see everybody's right. glossy eyes if you look, you know, left or right. <laughs> <laughs> so with the story locked down and the concept proven, work began on the ride film. Now, according to Jim Hill, MCA originally hired Boss Films run by Empire Strikes Back effects master Richard Edlund. So he was the guy that did the at at battle. That was, you know, amazing. Yes. Um, to create the sequences. Um, there are a few versions of the story about like what happened next that got them kicked off. Um uh, but there was an interview uh, with the Seasons Past podcast where Berkshire Ride, Berkshire Ride Films Douglas Trumbull said that uh, Universal had brought them in uh, to to show him what was done uh, because their version of the movie was making people sick. And so they wanted to go to somebody else who had some different experience to see if they could figure out what was causing that and make it to not happen. And. Trumbull's very famous in the special effects world. Um, he had worked um, on 2001 A Space Odyssey. Um, he directed Silent Running and did the special effects for that movie in the 1970s. So this guy was a luminary. And he was really one of the first pers- people to start pushing the idea of like ride films uh, and that integration between people and screens and trying to push higher frame rates and all kinds of other technologies to make the the film experience better um so his company ended up with contract to do the model work and the um the the film itself um a different group of people did the pre-show um same folks that worked on the those back to the future um programs that we talked about also worked on that um it's interesting what it what are some of the things that you remember about the film itself when you watched the film in the theater? Well, it was, it was all miniature. It was all like real yeah. things, nothing CGI. No, you're right. It was all, all practical. Did it seem dark to you? It was very dark. I mean, it, it's, it's almost like you hid the ride among the darkness because they couldn't do certain things with it. And, let's be honest, you build the model of Hill Valley and it's got to be dark at night because otherwise you're going to have to build a model to infinity to get all the, you know, you have to paint a backdrop. So everything was super, super, super muddy. And, and um, I mean, today it would just be a CGI film, you know? Yeah. Film. And that, and that... you could have, and you could have some bright scenes because <laughs> you didn't need to fool anybody with what they were seeing. Right. So that is not intentional, but that was a byproduct of the technology that was available at the time. And that's actually yeah. still one of his major complaints. He said that the, at the, even with the giant bulbs that IMAX used at the size of those screens, they only put out something like four lumens. And so it, he said, there's no contrast, you know, there's no richness to the color yeah. He's like, he was really disappointed. And, the, and they also shot it at 24 frames per second. He wanted to shoot it at a much higher frame rate. So that way you could, everything could be smoother. And and so, you know, he liked the work that he had, had done with all those miniatures, but he was in the end kind of disappointed by the quality because it really should have been brighter and faster. So it looked better. I mean, most, most of the, um, as we have talked about, it's like, Almost none of the films at Disney, especially the large ones, you know, the, were shot at 24 frames per second. And a lot of them were shot at 40 and other higher frame rates. So you didn't get the flicker. Um, it, one, one of the interesting things I noticed watching it, you know, now you're watching it 30 plus years after it was made, approaching 40. And like the dinosaurs, which were clearly... You know puppets models the 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 
the standard for dinosaurs at the time. When you consider that this was, so came out in 91, so it's made in 90. They made Terminator 2 in 1992. They made uh, Jurassic Park, I think it was 93. And it really does, uh, Terminator 2, by the way, like those, those two movies blew your mind when you when you saw them and especially jurassic park because every dinosaur we saw before jurassic park looked like the dinosaurs in the in the in these <laughs> in this attraction you know like they, they, yeah it's a dinosaur like i know, I, they I don't can't know that that's a, not what yeah a, i know they can't find yeah, a they dinosaur, can't have a real yeah, dinosaur so but it's cool it's cool that it looks like it that moved and, with a hand and, and and that was by the way that was part of what blew people away at the world's fair and then in universe of energy and you know, in the train tunnel at Disneyland is that you, like, you think you're like, eh, that's a, that looks like a dinosaur to me because what else would a dinosaur look like? You know, I'm sure if you got up real close and inspected it, you'd be like, ah, look at that. That's not right, you know. But I, that did stand out to me to see those two dinosaurs in here and think like, man, just a few short years later, all that would have been CGI and, yeah, you know, just a neater effect. So what's really interesting is when they first started thinking about how to actually achieve that, their first thought was actually to put people in dinosaur suits. <laughs> and <laughs> right. And, I'm, I'm just all I'm thinking of is Pete Wee's big adventure. <laughs> were, oh so he rides through. Because <laughs> they yeah. were trying to figure they were. I mean, literally, they're trying to figure out how do we do this? So you have, you know, you have the motion control camera like on the robot arm, like coming through. It's like, well, how else can you articulate this? They built the suits. I think they did some tests and they're just like, Jesus, this looks horrible. And so they ended up building puppets that were computer controlled so that way they could move them you know d you know digitally quote unquote via the computer to synchronize them with the uh the flying delorean cars and the um and the, the camera moves at the same time so there's pictures of the insides of them and it's all just cylinders and so they're very sophisticated puppets but they are essentially puppets now, were you uh, going to talk about uh, the Trumbull and the camera issue they had? Go for it. Um, Jump in. I got my book here and I was reading this because I love this stuff. I mean, they were using IMAX cameras and they got all these miniatures and it says that they were they were bulky, huge cameras. I mean, they still are if you're shooting at IMAX, even, you know, whatever. What's, I forget. What's, what's the size of an IMAX? Oh, so it's a 35. It's, it's a 70 millimeter 70. film. Turn sideways. Okay. So it's it's even wider than H what you would huge camera use. rigs, and they couldn't get Giant. them into the models to fit. So I guess they had a, a special lightweight IMAX animation cameras designed just for this project, just to make this work. So again, I mean, it's just just crazy. When you think about it, this is like Universal's Horizons thirty second ending, except they 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 did it for six minutes. Right, you know, four yeah, it's like four minutes and forty seconds, I think. Yeah, um, and all of these, the breaks that that are in there are are because you couldn't, as you said, Todd, the models would be so long if you tried to do these as long continuous shots. So they would build a section of it, and then they would do something like fly through the sign, and that would be the cut point in order to like set up with a different model and be able to continue down from that point. So um, tedious. So... And it took almost two years to shoot that footage. It was a long, uh, arduous process. In it. But imagine, like, you have to build models of all that stuff. And, and looking at it, I, I, in retrospect, I don't know if I'm being fooled by the upscaling that people are putting on YouTube videos. But, like, those models are not fantastic. No. They're, they're good, but, like, they don't have that like rich the texture of like super realism they're almost you know they're kind of a little bit fakey but again it's so dark and you go it's by so dark stuff it moves so enough. fast right um, you're constantly moving but at the same yeah, time I mean, you're there's... being jostled around as you're watching it there on the screen as opposed to sitting in your living room with a right you know light light beer by miller but at the same time there's stuff like the um, the hover tires, when they're in that down position, they're shining lights down and it's real light from those tires illuminating the model. Oh. And it looks, that part looks so good. And they had to have a light thin of uh, thing of smoke on there too, just to get that, that shadow effect. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's so funny. It, it is, it is really, a, 
a, a, a such a measure and contrast because you have that that kind of beautiful work and then they would do some optical thing where they would overlay like smoke or the lava coming up which was shot by somebody else sandwiched in when they would do the optical compositing to go from what and like that stuff doesn't look good <laughs> but again it's only on the screen for a second or two so you don't really notice it when you're on the ride but you look right. back now and you're like oh that doesn't look as good as it really could um but still just that experience in that ride is was so good and i i it's one of those things where it the Simpsons can't compare. I, I completely get it. It's like they closed it in 2007. And of course, because you're going into the 2015 future, at some point it becomes ridiculous. Like, you yeah. can't, you know, when it's 2014 or it is, it is finally 2015, you're going into 2015. It's and it's not anything like 2015. Of course, you can't perpetuate that. Um, so I understand but going from a DeLorean to a crusty, the crown relic. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big, big jump. I just want to see that model. I, I can't imagine this was pre led. So, I mean, how many wires were underneath that thing? Oh, oh yeah. They probably used the, what are they called? The uh, grains of rice. Bags. Oh, those ones. And there's, um, gosh, there's Street all kinds light of, and... there's all kinds of details. Yeah. Like there's, there's all kinds of chase people. lights on the buildings. It's interesting. The, it's the future, but for some reason they designed like a very 1950s look for a, a lot of the signs, maybe as a way to kind of, you know, close that gap between the fifties and the yeah. 2050. Most of the, most of the signs are like bubbly and like sort of googie architecture looking like vid city. And there's like video golf and all these weird, uh, like uh, fake businesses that, are in there, uh, but those have a very 1950s look, like messed into meshed into this futuristic architecture. There's stuff like um, like transport tubes that go between buildings, and there's little people inside of them. <laughs> as as you go by, there's um, silhouettes in a lot of the windows, which were probably just cutouts. Uh, it probably didn't even move, but it just looks great. Um, there there is a styrofoam coffee cup in the town square, like in the back that I don't know if it was left there intentionally as a gag or if no one removed it. But if you know where to look, it's like there is a styrofoam cup sitting amongst the models. That's great. Um, the second time you go through through town square, but oh, oh, such a tremendous the, amount of work. What was the time period specific show where somebody left a water bottle? Oh, oh I think it was Game of Thrones, wasn't yes. it? Or something like that. There Somebody was like left a, a plastic I think there's bottle a of water. Starbucks cup. cup. Yeah, it was a Starbucks <laughs> cup. That's <laughs> it. That's a period yeah. piece. I right want there. you off the set. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it made it to air. That's the, yeah. That's the you know that made it to air, and I'm sure they've CGI'd it out of now subsequent releases. I am but. surprised. I'm. I would love a report from Brian and Todd here. Uh, they filmed this all the miniatures and everything in Massachusetts. You guys were right down the road and. Yeah, we stopped by. Yeah, see if there's yeah, we any checked out the model. Or... <laughs> Todd's, Todd's, Todd's got the model in his basement. Yeah, it looks He's... beautiful. We'll fly, we'll do an HBO flyover one night. Of... House Atonic, that, Massachusetts. The... Do you know where that is? House Atonic. House Atonic. Uh, good question. Tastes right? delicious. Yeah. It was in an old textile mill, it says. It's great with gin. <laughs> it's a textile mill on every corner in Massachusetts. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, look at that. Oh, yeah. They're all, de they're all defunct. But yeah, it was, it was a, they weren't still making textiles. They're, they're all lofts now. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Well, that said, you guys have to find that and then uh, visit the visit the site and take some pictures outside. So, Satonic Mass. Take a DeLorean oh my gosh, there. that's out south near... That's way out in the middle of nowhere. That's south. It's at least of two miles away. No, that's out near <laughs> Lenox and Pittsfield and Great Barrington. I mean, Massachusetts isn't that big, is it? Or is it? No, that's pretty. It, far. It's a pretty big state. Is it okay? Is it like it's, Florida? It's wide. Big? It's it's wide. It's yeah. like the Panhandle. It's like oh, okay. lo a long ways from one side to the other. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yes, it's small compared to Florida, but uh, but no, who's uh, who's is yeah, it's way out there. There is not much there. I'm surprised. I mean. Yeah, I am. Uh, well, but there's makes the mill. It the I mean, there's place the, to... the Monument Mills Powerhouse. There's a whole bunch of mill buildings. Uh, but uh, yeah, interesting. No one's going to sneak in there 
and spoil the sort of the fun. So uh, <laughs> I will I will close this off by reading a uh, press release from uh, from the ride, getting everybody hyped up. Actually, here it's very much like your uh, like your video. Unlock the mysteries of the space time continuum, traveling back to the future. The ride at Universal Studios Florida. Imagine the most intense and enveloping multi-sensory motion picture experience possible, engulfed in cold fog, blasting through the space-time continuum, breaking into an otherworldly dimension, free-falling down volcanic tunnels aflame with molten lava, cascading over glacial ice fields, colliding with prehistoric dinosaurs, catapulting and careening through the past, present, and future, and... <laughs> excuse me, in a time vehicle to stop a villain and prevent him from changing destiny. Back to the Future of the Ride, officially premiering to the public at Universal Studios Florida on Thursday, May 2nd, defies the imagination. The only thing really they could have done better was that that, that, <laughs> that saves the Earth's density. That would have been I was just going to say that. They really missed the opportunity to yeah. drop a density in there. They should have, yeah. Don't I know you from somewhere? Yes. Yes. I'm George, George McFly. I'm your density. I mean, your destiny. Oh. And McFly! Back to the Future the Ride brings together the most dynamic motion base with sophisticated hydraulics, multi channel sound, live effects, and a groundbreaking Omnimax film to create a total sensory impact experience never before achieved in any media or studio attraction, said Terry Winnick, the ride's producer and vice president of special products for Universal Studio Florida. Whenever you see on the screen, you will also feel, adds Winnick, state of the art special effects give the illusion of time travel. This is a new dimension of thrills and excitement that must be experienced to believe, says Douglas Trimble of Berkshire Ride Film, who directed the four-minute multi-million dollar special effects ride film, which is a pivotal part of this cutting-edge simulator ride experience. Trimble's other special effects directorial credits include 2001 A Space Odyssey and Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Back to the Future, The Ride, continues the record-breaking movie trilogy, Back to the Future, about time travel, directed by Robert Zemeckis, scored by Alan Silvestri, and starring Michael J. Fox as Marty McFly, Christopher Lloyd as Doc Brown, and Thomas Wilson as Biff Tannen, the nastiest villain of all time. In this chapter, the eccentric Doc Brown, master of time travel, is at home conducting experiments in his new laboratory, the Institute of Future Technology. Doc has just created his most futuristic invention yet, a convertible eight-passenger time vehicle that's faster and more energy efficient than his earlier time machine. But what's this? Jumping gigawatts, Biff Tannen is loose in the Institute of Future Technology and threatens to end the universe as we know it. With no time to lose, you'll jump into the driver's seat of the most mind-blowing, pulse-racing, barrier-breaking journey of your life. Doc will guide you by remote control as you careen your way through time in pursuit of the evil Biff. The chase is on. Engulfed in three-dimensional images, you'll fly to the futuristic Hill Valley of Back to the Future 2, circa 2015, and blast through the eons to the chilling Ice Age. With dizzying speed, you'll thunder through caverns, crevices, and canyons of sheer jagged ice, collide with a glacier, and explode into the volcanic era. Up, up you fly, propelled through the immense open mouth of a Tyrannosaurus Rex, erupting through a volcano and plunging over the edge of molten lava fall in a sheer vertical drop. <laughs> Back to the They're future. literally <laughs> describing the entire ride to <laughs> you. This was posted. <laughs> this was no, like, this went out to all the newspapers. Went out to newspapers. Uh, okay. They, I'm sure they would pick a section of it, right? Yeah. Yeah, John Davidson sitting there looking at uh, John Tesh for Entertainment of the Night saying, take these two lines. We'll put these in the show. You know? Like, uh, that was something. Oh, uh, and that's, we're only halfway through. So I'll no, just, well, I'll just you can drop read the rest on uh, the, Yeah, I'll the drop the it right here. There. So, uh, so what is neat though? So, uh, the ride is 13 stories tall. So I guess maybe as big as, uh, as, uh, Tower, Tower Terror. Terror, right? Uh, it's housed in the world's largest twin Omnimax theater domes. Um, each, each Back to the Future Omnimax screen is twice the size of a regular Omnimax. Um, 
of the screens are actually holes. So that way the sound can come out. The screens have 72,400,000 holes. Now you know how many holes it takes to fill the upper hole, right? Um, The screens weigh 12 tons each. Uh, They were the largest of their type in the world at that time. Took six months to make. Um, Let's see. Uh, Anything else exciting here? Uh, 10,000 watts of sound in each one of the dome. Okay. Um, I wonder if they had it, one of those big speakers like Marty blew out, you know, in the big little <laughs> mini yellow guitar. <laughs> So um, how when when was it retired and rethemed as the Simpsons? So it closed in in um March 30th, 2007. All in, right, so it lasted Florida. 15 That's 16 a pretty years. Decent run, it lasted a decent it. I mean c- considering the film was made, you know, not, your first one came out in 1985, last one came out in 1990, so there was like a 5-year period for the for the films for the franchise yeah for it it lasted a good amount of time a very very respectable and i remember when when people you know when they were closing it down a lot of people were disappointed that they were getting rid of it even with the time conundrum of 2015 coming uh people loved that ride yeah well universal the, the the only ride that has survived the the axe has been et i mean <laughs> isn't it the true that like literally everything that has opened that park has gone the uh yeah you know, it gone is, the way of the dodo bird e- they've et is as as in, and, and i will say this i think um you know we talk a, a, a lot about this kind of stuff you know the, when things get old and then when things become classics for film you know for a studio park based on what we'll call popular film. I don't have any issue with stuff getting swapped out on a regular basis because yeah. you, you want to be current, you know, you, yeah, I could make a, Oh, let's, could you build a Godfather attraction today? I'm like, yeah, but like hardly anybody would know what that is right. anymore. So I think it is good. It's a great they, video game. For, yeah. <laughs> for, the, for the youngsters. They love the game. <laughs> <laughs> you get the whole thing. You play Don Corleone. Al Pacino you... didn't even lend his voice. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. They're like, "Hey, he sounds weird in this movie. <laughs> Got to kill them um, all." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sounds like he's from that uh, Adam Sandler movie with the twins. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um, you're right. So, and I don't know how. I mean, they closed ET in Hollywood to put the mummy in there, um, right. which is itself getting kind of old in the tooth now. You know, I I wouldn't be surprised if that gets changed out at some point. But yeah, I mean, Murder She Wrote became Xena Warrior Princess and is now where Transformers is. Oh, really? Yes, the Fantastic World of Hanna Barbera got was, redone into Jimmy Neutron. Jimmy Neutron, yeah. and was oh. then redone again as the Minions. And I was Ghost, Ghostbusters was where? Where's that? Now? Ghostbusters is became Twister, okay. and is now Escape. <laughs> And not escape from New York. <laughs> Get away from Jimmy Fallon. <laughs> yeah, that was the choice. They went backwards to a Kurt Russell. It was a Freudian <laughs> slip. Race, race through New York with Jimmy Fallon. Uh, I'm just going to... I have to throw in my eternal love for the fantastic world of Hanna-Barbera. I loved that attraction. Yeah, it was and a great attraction. I just loved... You know, you were in a you know bench motion simulator and you just went through every obscure Hanna-Barbera property you're flying by with Grape Ape and all these other things you know it's the Jetsons and the Flintstones and it was just a bundle of fun and you said that went uh, that that was where Minions went yes that's that's where Minions is now it's still Jimmy Neutron and then 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 Minions minions. but they actually had Fantastic World of Hanna-Barbera in a couple of other parks it was Oh, okay. 
Yeah, that was in, I guess, maybe the Paramount Parks. I don't know. Someone will write in and correct us. But it was definitely in other parks. Oh, yeah. And, and, um, gosh. I think it might have been in Ohio. Cedar Point, I think, I think had something I with th- it. Maybe, yeah. So they licensed Or King's them, Island, maybe. Yeah. Paramount. Would that be Paramount? Yeah, it could, could be. But it was in a couple of other places. And it eventually got retired from all of them. But well, Howard, I just want to assure everybody now that the timeline has been corrected, we, we, this will not become a regular occurrence. We'll be back on. I mean, we did Sea World, right? We yeah. did. Uh, I, well, that was Good Neighbors. Yeah. Good Neighbors. And we did, we did uh, good the neighbors, Hotel but, Plaza Boulevard. So we, you know, you branch know. out here and there. Well, yeah, you know, we just we'll we'll be back to Disney for three or four more years, and then we might, you know, do Splendid China. Or... We're going to do a whole episode on <laughs> yeah. bus stops. Been T- I know Todd wants to do boardwalk and baseball. Oh, you know. just looking for that one. That's, oh, that's man. housing. That's how that was my haunt. We, we should do <laughs> some of the original haunt. Kennedy Space Center stuff, too, because that has changed over time. Oh, dude, the well, stuff is all still there. It's just in nicer buildings now. It's just in different... different yeah, oh, it's in different... Around. It's so funny. I go back there, because we used to go there a lot, and... I mean, I will say the displays are set up much nicer now than they were when I went in the 70s. But it is a lot of that same stuff is still well, still yeah, well, there. We're not making new Mercury capsules or anything. <laughs> yeah, that's very <laughs> so, true. You know, I mean, it's just they're just moving the stuff around and displaying it differently. <sighs> Good point. Well, yeah. gentlemen, this has been a nice kickoff to the year. It has. It has. So. Thank you very much, Hal, for putting this together. It was a, a nice, it was pretty heavy. Whoa, this is heavy. There's that word again, heavy. Why are things so heavy in the future? Is there a problem with the Earth's gravitational pull? What? Appreciate that. And uh, any t-shirts? We're going to do something with this? Yeah, we're going to do We're going to do some universal shirts cool. uh, for this. I actually was looking through old photos today, and I found the like grand opening logo. Oh, wow. uh, which was on the podium. So yeah, so that's going to be in the shop when this drops. And who knows? We might throw a couple of you know. Well, before we go, Todd, I got to show you modules. these uh, new matchbooks I got for my new detailing service. Before we go here, there. Oh, absolutely. Two two coats on that, please, <laughs> JT. Two coats. Okay. <laughs> now, JT. I was just finishing up the first coat. You're that's right. right. That's right. <laughs> Don't con me. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I t- side note, why did they pick 50s Biff to be the villain in the ride and not the old Biff from the 80s? Like, he's in that you know, 50s that the rolled up sleeve and the because that's what he actually, actually looked like. Yeah, he didn't need a yeah. makeup budget to, to yeah, that's you know. Tom Wilson, and was. that's the one in it that you were most familiar with, which again makes okay, so there's there's another time thing here, like. If it's young Biff from 1955, how did he get the DeLorean? You know, how did he steal that and come to the Institute of Future Technology when he's in the past? I gotta so watch this. I feel like they hit on all this. I feel like they so have they to. say. Okay. Like so, there is a very quick bit of exposition where where Doc Brown actually says, "How did you do it?" And he's like, "Why don't you ask him?" And he like rips the tape off of this guy's mouth, and he's like. We had a team in 1955 conducting some experiments, and he must have stowed on board. Oh, I'm like, there you go. Oh. how do you stow on board a two-seater <laughs> car without anybody <laughs> noticing? Maybe, well, maybe they were the testing the eight-passenger. Eight <laughs> yeah. yeah, they were testing the eight-passenger. Eight now, I maybe. did read they had a, and the last thing, uh, an alternate ending where Biff got covered in manure, and they didn't use it. They filmed it, and they didn't use it. Oh, oh yeah. Where did the manure come from? I don't know, but like he crashed into a manure truck instead of the, the oh, building. Manure. Well, that yeah. would be... That would I make hate sense. Yeah. manure. Yeah. So, ending on that. Funny. Awesome. Great, great oh. ride. Thank you, gentlemen. And uh, we'll be back next month with another Retro Disney World podcast episode. You know what it's going to be, right? It, how you're leading it. What do we got? It's going to be Pleasure Island Part 4. I went there back. We actually did... We've done three. Part 3? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> What's part four? The Fun part Meister's four. back. <laughs> and I'm realizing as I do this, four will not be the last one. We're oh probably. my <laughs> God. We, this Peter Jackson over here. Get your fish bowls and your We've 20 moved into gun, the- 21 rum salute. <laughs>
<laughs> he's recording this the one. the Hobbit series yeah. because we've finished Lord of the Rings. We're we going to be recording this at like some ridiculous megahertz. Uh, well, the thing is, we don't have to. Do, we'll do one a year, right? We'll That's, we'll build these out. Well, the, the CD box we'll set will be coming soon with all the episodes. <laughs> one disc per episode. And... The best He's part just is going to start a separate podcast. <laughs> we're going to retire someday, and how's it like? We have to come out of retirement because Pleasure Island 16. They're coming back. So, 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 what are they doing? Back. Pleasure Island Part 7. <laughs> <laughs> we got to cover Disney Springs. We got to cover Disney Springs. <laughs> we're all in walkers. We're in the our 80s doing this. You know? Oh, goodness. And to those listening, as always, you can hit us up and uh, if you can donate at retrowdw.com forward slash support us, they'll take you to our. Uh, T Public Shop, where you can get all of the T-shirts and merchandise and all the great stuff that we make. Um, and uh, also, as, if you can, give us a shout out on your favorite uh, podcasting app, wherever that is. Give us a rating, a star, however many you think we're worth. Hopefully, it's five. And with that, uh, we will see you next month. And Brian, take us out. Follow the Lake Buena Vista Historical Society on Twitter and Instagram at LBV History, and on the web at lbvhistory.org. For all things Retro Disney World, including exclusive merchandise, visit us on the web at RetroWDW.com and on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at RetroWDW. And follow our hosts, Todd McCartney, on Twitter at WDWMS, Hal Bowers on Twitter and Instagram at GoAwayGreen, JT Couser on Twitter at LS1JT and on YouTube at Rubber City Motoring and on the web at RubberCityMotoring.com. And you can find me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Brian P. Miles. Retro Disney World is the monthly podcast of the Lake Buena Vista Historical Society, a nonpartisan, nonprofit, tax exempt 501c3 organization, and is not affiliated in any way with the Walt Disney Corporation or any of its subsidiary or affiliated entities. Music